thank you. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. And I get to talk about my favorite uh, topic, uh, Ludwig von Mises and the Austrian School of Economics. I got interested in the Austrian school, in fact, when I was in high school back in the 1960s. And uh, so much so that I decided to major in economics when I went to college and university and uh, was very fortunate and lucky to be able to uh, basically devote a lot of my time to doing research, writing, and uh, presentations on Austrian economics at Hillsdale College as the Mises professor. Uh, but what I noticed uh, in doing my reading and research and thinking about uh, members of the Austrian school was that, in fact, there was very little that was known about or written about uh, Mises himself, his intellectual development, his personal history, uh, his background, uh, the activities and events that he was involved in in the Vienna between the two world wars. Uh, maybe some of you are familiar with his own book, uh, Notes and Recollections, which is his memoirs. But in fact, uh, I found it an extremely frustrating book to read because in comparison to many uh, well-known or prominent people who in their later years write their memoirs or their, their autobiographies, uh, he wrote an extremely uh, cryptic and uh, skimpy memoir. Uh, there's very little about his activities in Vienna, what ideas or events he was involved in. Uh, in fact, uh, it leaves you more frustrated about what you wanted to know than what it reveals. And as a consequence, uh, quite a while ago, uh, I thought uh, what would be a useful uh, task would be trying to begin doing some research on uh, Mises' uh, personal background, uh, the events of his life, and try to incorporate that into an intellectual biography, which um, I am hoping to be able to uh, uh, get done in the not, new, not too distant future. Um, the one thing that impressed me when I read his notes and recollections is that certain passages in the book gave a different impression of Mises the man than is often the public image of him. Uh, many people, including many in the economics profession who may have a passing knowledge of Austrian economics, often think that Mises was a dogmatic intransigent, that he did uh, not suffer fools gladly, that uh, he made enemies, that he could not persuade, argue, or interact with people of different views, uh, and that this sort of a personality of, of extreme confidence yet close-mindedness uh, made it difficult for him to uh, win or Im win the day or influence events. And if one talks to people who know him or knew him, uh, it is true that that was there, that element in him. But what struck me when I read Notes and Recollections is that there was seemed to be aspects of him that were, that was not reflected in that public image. For example, when in the book he talks about his private seminar, uh, he says, my main teaching effort was focused on my private seminar. Beginning in 1920, during the months to June of, and uh, to October, a number of young people gathered around me once every two weeks. My office in the Chamber of Commerce was spacious enough to accommodate 20 to 25 persons. We usually met at 7 in the evening and adjourned to 10.30. In these meetings, we informally discussed all important problems of economics, social philosophy, sociology, logic, and the epistemology of the sciences of human action. In this circle, the younger Austrian School of Economics lived on. In this circle, the Viennese culture continued one of its last blossoms. Here I was neither teacher nor director of the seminar. I was merely first among peers who himself benefited more than he gave. And then what struck me in it, that gave an undogmatic sense of him. We formed neither school, congregation, nor sect. We helped each other more through contradiction than agreement. But we agreed and were united on one endeavor to further the sciences of human action. Each went his own way, guided by his own law. We never organized or undertook anything that resembled the nauseous carrying on of the German imperial and post-war scientists. We never thought to publish a journal or a collection of essays. Each worked by himself as befits a thinker. And yet each one of us labored for the circle, seeking no compensation other than a simple recognition, not the applause of his friends. There was greatness in this unpretentious exchange of ideas. In it, we all found happiness and satisfaction. Now that presents an image of himself and how he viewed himself and the people he interacted with, which is often different than the one that was often uh, portrayed in, in certain views or concepts that people have of him in the economics profession. So that intrigued me too to try to find out about him. 
So this past summer, I had an opportunity to begin sort of the uh, the legwork on doing this, and uh, I was a fortuitous. I had a fortuitous circumstance, is that uh, when I was in Moscow in uh, the summer of 1991, uh, I met someone who became my wife. Uh, for whom I suppose I should thank Mikhail Gorbachev, because if it hadn't been for Glasnost, I couldn't have gone there. And anyway, uh, besides privatizing state property, uh, I also uh, had the lucky, lucky, lucky circumstance is that uh, I've been able to use her in, in, in two double uh, linguistic endeavors. When I have been in the former Soviet Union, I have exploited her to be my translator into Russian. And while I studied German for reading when I was in college, I must confess that my German was always bad, and as years goes by, becomes even worse. My wife also reads and speaks rather good German. So here was my opportunity. A built-in translator to assist me in my work. And I must confess that all of my work this past summer uh, as a starting endeavor would have been impossible without her. Also, she had another talent, which I must say, as an armchair scholar, I had not. Uh, her background is in uh, intellectual history, particularly of the American studies. And she had done archive work. As an armchair theorist, I hadn't. So here on top of, besides someone who could read and, and, and go through the German, she was someone who knew the ins and outs how to carefully go through the archives and not miss interesting or useful things. So in fact, really, it's uh, both of us who should be uh, up here talking to you, because uh, I couldn't have done any of this without her. But anyway, uh, what were some of the things that I discovered? Uh, at least tentatively on this first trip for three weeks, which is really not a lot of time because I found that there's a lot more uh, that in fact I need to go back and uh, pursue. Well, first of all, most of us know almost nothing about Mises's family. And what I was able to find as one item was in fact a file in the state archives on Mises's grandfather. And in fact, it was his grandfather who was given the title Fon, the title of nobility. What for? Does anybody know? Well, hardly any of us have had an inkling, and Mises didn't, doesn't talk about it in Notes and Recollections. His grandfather was the head of the Orthodox Jewish community in Lemberg, now the city in western Ukraine called Lvov. And it was as for his duties as the head of the Orthodox Jewish community that the emperor bestowed this title upon him. And as part of this, uh, Mises' grandfather had to write in hand a history of the family. And I, I, we were able to photocopy this entire handwritten file of the family history. And interestingly, en interestingly enough, shortly before Ludwig was born, his grandfather prepared this, these documents for the, uh, for the bestowing of this nobility title. And one of the things was his grandfather wrote a little family tree. So here's the family tree of the Mises uh, clan, so to speak. And down here is, in fact, Mises' father, Arthur. But there's no lines below it, because, in fact, there was no Ludwig or Richard yet. But uh, we were able to, therefore, get an entire document that enables us to reconstruct uh, the history of the Mises family before up to and including Mises himself. Well, they'll be here for people to look at, uh, you know, after the presentation. My, 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 my wife, being someone who did all this archive, uh, archive work in Moscow, sort of like, you know, you know, every little document is precious and whatnot. Um, but we also found something also extremely interesting. The Mises coat of arms. Yes, Lou had a coat of arms. <laughs> And this was the coat of arms, which, of course, this is in black and white photo, uh, 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 photocopy. But I had my ca camera, and we were able to take a rather clear colored picture of the coat of arms. Now, if you look at Mises' uh, books written after the First World War, as was expected when Austria became a republic, uh, he dropped the font. All of the books in the German editions just say Ludwig Mises. And he didn't, uh, therefore, uh, draw much attention to it. But he was a, a f ennobled family, and he did have the title passed on to him. So there is the Mises coat of arms, uh, which would be fascinating uh, to actually get a, 
a more uh, clear and, and blown up copy just for some type of a framing. And I hope perhaps for the book I can sort of include such uh, photos uh, for this. Another aspect of, uh, that was interesting that we came across, uh, again in the state archives, uh, was Mises' educational file. And uh, what we found in the educational file uh, was uh, the bestowing of the uh, PhD upon Mises in 1906 for having studied at the university. Um, and then in 1913, uh, he applied for a position to be Praviat Docent, a unpaid or unsalaried part-time lecturer at the university. And we found the, uh, the file giving this, this uh, uh, teaching uh, credential to him. Um, this is from the, uh, the, uh, uh, one of the rectors at the university. And he says that on June 11, 1912, um, Mises has been given this opportunity to teach in political economy, uh, having uh, completed two requirements. He had published his book, Theory of Money and Credit, the year before in 1912. Uh, it says here, under the uh, supervision of Professor Filipovich and Professor Wieser, two prominent Austrian economists at the university, and uh, that he also had given sort of like a trial lecture. And uh, the other members of the university and the political economy department had listened and decided that this fellow was okay, he could put his thoughts together and deliver a talk. And uh, what he had written on in the lecture, the public lecture that they had reviewed and decided that he was qualified, was a lecture on cost of living and the theory concerning cost of living. And it was on that basis, uh, a lecture that he had given on February 20, uh, 27, 1913, that this was bestowed upon him. Well, then also the, uh, one, of the, one of the deans or rectors at the university had said, well, this is fine, but we need to have Mises' vita. Right? We have to, you know, an official statement. And we found the documents that Mises signed with his own signature on them. For example, well, what was Mises qualified to teach? Okay, what could Mises teach? We can't have this guy teach anything. Well, he tells people what he's qualified to teach. And uh, he, he typed this up, and his signature is there. He said that he was qualified to teach uh, monetary theory and banking. He was qualified to teach commercial trade theory. He was qualified to teach a course on modern capitalism. He was qualified to teach a history of the Austrian economy in the 19th century. He was qualified to teach um, a course on the history of Austrian currency since 1848. And he could, uh, he could teach an introductory course on the principles of economics to beginners. That's like Econ 101. And he could also teach an introductory course uh, on um, beginners on uh, the principles of economic policy. And uh, then his actual curriculum vita, which has the official state stamps on it. Again, two pages with uh, his signature at the bottom. Uh, is very much like the Vita that he had prepared in 1909 when he applied for a job to work with the Chamber of Commerce in Austria, and which uh, Margaret von Mises translated and includes in an appendix in her own book. But whereas the Chamber of Commerce uh, Vita was prepared in 1909, this is in 1913 when he has been working uh, at the Chamber for a while, and he explains that his duties at the Chamber have in included problems of economic policy, evaluation of tax legislation, and dealing with uh, uh, evaluations and, and critical proposals on various commercial policy theories concerning the legislation. But what's interesting is how he tries to assure himself for them to approve it. And that is, he says, that at the university, he has studied with all of these famous and important and, 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 and uh, significant professors who have influenced his thinking profoundly. And now, having learned so much from them, he now wishes to share all the knowledge he's gotten from them by standing beside them and teaching with them at the university. In other words, he's buttering them up. So, and that, on that basis, um, he was able to get, um, he was able to get um, his status to teach at the university. Then we found there the actual document, which was uh, dated May 7, uh, 1918, uh, 
And this document was saying is that Mises was no longer just this unsalaried professor, but he was promoted. He's still on salary, but promoted. He's now an associate professor, and this was May 7, 1918. But what was interesting about this document is a stamp that's on it. Now, this is a 1918 stamp, but it has a swastika on it. What had clearly happened is that after the Anschluss in March 1938, Mises, who was not one of the favorites of the German National Socialist Party, and as some of you may know, Mises' personal papers and library were carted off by the Gestapo and disappeared. Obviously, some Gestapo agent had been given the instructions to go through the educational files on everyone who was considered on their uh, not-to-be-desired list to check if there was any information that can be used against them. So this 1918 file had been per perused by a Gestapo agent, and he had stamped that, yes, it has been looked at for information to be used. Now, Mises began working at the Chamber of Commerce in 1909, but there was a period when he had a break from that. And that break was World War I. Mises served in the Austrian army in an artillery regiment on the Eastern Front. And uh, having known that from uh, information uh, that he mentions briefly in his book and that Bettina Graves and her bibliographies have mentioned, I then hunted down in the state archives his military jacket. And uh, we found it. And uh, this was actually the cover of the, uh, the military jacket, saying that this is for Ludwig von Mises, uh, Lieutenant in the Reserves, Regiment Number 30, Artillery Regiment Number 30. And here is his uh, little generalized front page information, his name, his birth of date, his religion, and he listed Jewish. And then uh, in the rest of the uh, files are when he served in the reserves, he did a year in the reserves, he then, like being in the reserves, had his period when he served a certain number of days for a month following that, and uh, when he was uh, uh, given good reviews and that he had done his duty. And then, of course, came the war. And what we found in the, ar in the archives, which was new information to me, uh, maybe people like uh, Leonard Ligio or Ralph, who uh, had opportunities to meet Mises, and, uh, and uh, such as Ralph, who, uh, who studied with Hayek, perhaps uh, they knew this, but I did not know that Mises had, in fact, been decorated for bravery under fire during World War I. And he, in fact, was decorated or cited three times. And uh, one of these, which I've uh, brought here, uh, was in, let me get my notes here, uh, was for action on July 31st, 1917. Let me give you the background. Uh, the war had not gone very, uh, very good for the Russian army through most of uh, the campaigns of the First World War. In fact, the Germans had occupied a large part of what then was Russian, Russian Poland and parts of what today we call uh, Latvia and Lithuania. Though uh, the Russians had pushed into parts of eastern Austria, the province of Galatia, where in fact Mises had been born. Uh, on July 1st, 1917, uh, the provisional government of Russia uh, attempted to regain the, uh, the offensive on the Eastern Front, particularly to bolster the provisional government. And what was uh, begun, what became known was as the Kerensky Offensive. And uh, Mises participated in resisting this Russian attempt on the Austrian Front. And uh, the handwriting was unbelievably difficult to decipher. Uh, it was, it was the, the commendation was written by, obviously, his senior officer. Uh, my wife, Anna, who had to study this with a mi magnifying glass just to read the words, I mean, the handwriting is terrible, has told me that not only was his grammar bad, but his spelling was bad. So Mises worked under an officer who obviously had not gone to the best of schools. Uh, we both of us are saying, now, now wait a second, what those letters are? Anyway, but what this says here is, the aforementioned Ludwig von Mises was engaged on July 31st, 1917, in the Battle of Z Zadova as commander of a large caliber uh, cannon unit. In the further course of action, 
Both of his advanced guard batteries were directed against superior guard fire of the enemy, the Russians. From this exposed position, he held back the enemy and made them retreat. <laughs> yes, he pushed back the Russian hordes. <laughs> In a following battle on August 2nd, 1917, he took part in the outstanding job of knocking out one of the enemy batteries, in which he brought back three of the enemy's cannons and, uh, and one cargo wagon into our hands. Mises as war hero. <laughs> Whoever said these, the, these classical liberals aren't willing to go into battle and fight for their country. Okay. Mises, no pacifist he. <laughs> okay. Um, I, it didn't show up in the records, but it's clear that it, due to some of the, the action he saw on the front, he had some physical problem, particularly in hip, a hip injury, uh, which required him to apply for uh, re rest and recreation on the home front. And uh, part of the military file was his medical file as well. And uh, it was very interesting. Mises was a very determined fellow. Um, he applied for six weeks leave to go to this resort in the Austrian Alps. And they gave him four weeks. Uh, but being persistent, while he was away for his four, four, four weeks, he kept writing he wanted an extra two weeks. I have a feeling he just liked it there. And uh, he just wanted to re rest and recuperate a bit longer. But he was called back because what we then found out was that he received orders. Um, this was in 1918. In the summer of 1918, he had had this uh, uh, rest and recuperation. But as soon as this was over, he had orders to report back now into what was occupied Ukraine. If you remember a little bit of your history, in uh, March 1918, now the Bolsheviks' uh, revolution has occurred. Uh, Lenin is concerned with saving the revolution, and saving the revolution means making a separate peace with the Germans to have the Germans uh, off uh, their backs to be able to uh, resist what he sees as the emerging counter-revolutionary forces, and a separate peace was signed. And part of the separate peace resulted in uh, all of the Baltic republics, and today what we call Belarus and uh, Ukraine, coming under uh, central power occupation. And this meant that large parts of the Ukraine were under uh, Austrian occupation. And as part of this, Mises was ordered uh, in the fall of 1918 to immediately uh, take first class transportation. We found the telegram ordering him there. First class transportation to Odessa. And at Odessa, he was to become the commander in charge of currency and financial supervision for the occupied territories in the Ukraine. So Mises already is trying to, you know, maintain sound money in, 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 a, in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, what was not in the military file was any of the information uh, concerning what he did during his period in charge of uh, currency and financial matters in occupied Ukraine. I have a feeling that what this will require is to dig into not the state archives, but the imperial military archives and to get the information for the division and regiment and command that he was in, in, uh, connected with. And in that archive should be the records of his reports, memorandums of what he did and uh, the outcomes of his period there. And then uh, we also found the, the documents uh, when he was mustered out of the uh, army, uh, which was in early 1919. I must, con I'm, uh, after the war, he, uh, went back to his job at uh, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, but he also had another uh, position uh, for two years at the end of the war, and that is he was the Austrian commissioner for the League of Nations for Austrian Reparations. Uh, and I did not have an opportunity to go through those archives in Vienna. I'm hoping to make a trip to Geneva where the League of Nations archives are because it would be very interesting to see because uh, some of you who may know some of the history after the First World War, uh, there was a large controversy and, dis and dispute among the governments of Europe and the United States and among 
economic uh, 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 economists in the interwar period concerning problems of reparations. Could the defeated country, in its condition of uh, economic devastation and reconstruction, afford to pay reparations? And it would be interesting to see, and I hope to be able to see uh, getting these archives, how Mises managed and worked and put into place the Austrian payment of reparations and how he saw financially this was to be done. I didn't have a chance to go through this. I'm hoping to. Um, I must say that one of the most difficult nuts to crack in Vienna when I was there was the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I met with uh, a few times people who presently work at the Chamber of Commerce, and I am beginning to get from them uh, items from the Chamber archives, specifically uh, internal speeches and memorandums and policies analyses that Mises did for the Chamber analyzing both international and Austrian financial and monetary and trading policy. Uh, and, and these seem very interesting, and I'm hoping to be able to get more, to reconstruct his experiences as economic policy evaluator, policy proposer on fiscal and monetary and currency policy from a period from before the First World War until 1934. Because we often think of Mises as, as, as sort of the a priori theorist, uh, always emphasizing economics is just a theoretical science and, and uh, no empirical aspect. But in fact, Mises as policy analyst had to deal with quantitative statistical data all the time for his policy evaluations for the chamber. And I hope uh, getting more of these, I'll be able to reconstruct Mises as concrete empirical policy analyst. One aspect of this policy uh, uh, portion of Mises's work is then, as some of you may know, uh, he helped found in 1926-1927 the Austrian Institute for Business Cycle Research, of which Friedrich Hayek was the first director. Um, and we were able to get into the archives of the Austrian Institute of what is now called Economic Research. And this was very interesting because no one had been in these archives, clearly, since the Second World War. Uh, one of the directors who we got an opportunity to meet and get to know a little bit ended up giving us carte blanche to go into the archives. So we went into the basement of this building and everything was in total disarray. There was no order. The oldest ones were on the bottom shelves, which is, you know, great to preserve documents. We, we were there for a week. This, this institute archives took us a week to go through out of the three weeks. We came out with our hands black each day. We had to arrange and organize the archives and put them into plastic folders to preserve them. And we also had opportunities, A, to do two things. One, to photocopy everything. And I'm now in the fortunate position that I, in fact, uh, perhaps not for Mises's uh, biography, but as a separate monograph or perhaps journal article, I, I now am able to reconstruct and uh, write, I should say we, I, German linguist here, uh, to write what in fact will be a history of the first 10 years of the Austrian Institute of Business Cycle Research when Mises was serving as vice president, Hayek was the first director and then replaced as director by Oscar Morgenstern to the period of the Anschluss. Uh, and we not only were able to photocopy certain things, but the director, who was a very nice fellow and was interested but had a rather nonchalant uh, attitude, said that if we wanted to have some of the original documents, it was okay as long as we left photocopies. So there was a complete file there. So we were able to get some originals, such as. This is the speech, very brief. It's, two, it's a page and a little bit more that Mises gave at a, uh, at a conference at the Austrian Chamber of Commerce in November 1926 making the case for the establishment of this Austrian Business Cycle Institute. Now what is Mises' arguments? I found this fascinating. Basically the gist of it, to give the brief version, is he says there are many institutes that have formed around the world concerned with the problem of looking at economic and business cycle phenomena with the use of statistics. We cannot deal with either theory or policy without a careful and detailed background of the statistical phenomena. What is missing in Austria is an independent objective such institute. Too often, the statistical studies are influenced by the biased subjective interests of the institute or the party that has organized work in this. 
And therefore, he is proposing and making a strong case that there be financial support for this institute, that there be an endorsement of this institute, precisely because it will be the supplier and the evaluator of the hard statistical facts to do better policy judgments without being influenced by the biases of party politics. And he says, and also pointing out, obviously, as bureaucrats tend to be bureaucrats, he says, and you need not worry that the people of this institute will fall back. And uh, I don't believe he uses the word laziness, but that's basically, he says, don't worry, these aren't going to be lazy bureaucrats. You'll get your money's worth out of them. And uh, in fact, uh, he did set up uh, the institute. And uh, what the records also showed in the archives is that Mises was a great fundraiser. Yes, yes, Mises as fundraiser. Now, most of it seemed to go through personal connections because the, the institute had connections, participants, and supporters with all of the branches of the Austrian Chamber of Commerce in the various cities of Austria, Graz, Salzburg, Innsbruck, as well as Vienna. And it's clear that Mises, as the vice president, was working with these people. So you don't really find a lot of documents specifically saying, you know, give money or this is what you should give. But one of the interesting things, we, things in Vienna is we met an elderly couple, both of which are now in their advanced 80s. His name is Ernst Jan. He was hired at the Austrian Institute for Business Cycle Research in the early 30s. He attended Mises' private seminar. He worked for Hayek and Morgenstern at the Institute. Um, and he told us two things, and that is that Mises, in fact, was the money man. He was the one who went around to all of the business organizations and branches of the Chamber of Commerce and kept the money flowing. He also pointed out is that for the uh, first years that when Hayek was the director was it was it was a period of bureaucratic chaos at the Institute. Yes, Mises, uh, Hayek showed that even Institute central planning leads to planned chaos. Records were not kept, documents weren't signed, paperwork that should have been done was always behind. Only order and rationality came in with Oscar Morgenstern. Uh, but clearly this was Mises' role. Uh, also what we found there were the, all the minutes of all the meetings of uh, the board of directors. Mises often served as secretary or as the chairman of the meetings. And in these, in these board of directed meetings are all the minutes where they're debating what should be the direction of the institute, what have their publications been, uh, what have, what's the general situation in which the institute has to function, who are they bringing in and hiring. Uh, for example, there is a well-known uh, uh, Austrian uh, scholar of this period and historian of economic thought called, named Karl Prebrum who posthumously, they published a huge history of economic thought book by him. In the minutes, it shows that Mises brought Karl Prebrum on as one of the board of directors, even though Karl Prebrum, in fact, was uh, sort of like a modern socialist or mo a modern liberal or moderate socialist. Mises was concerned with a broad umbrella support and then working with these people in sort of a, a sort of collaborative fashion to get what he wanted. And in fact, one of the curiosities we found in the files here was in fact, this is one of the advertisements that they sent out to people for the books they had available. And what books, had, this was in the early 30s, Hayek's uh, Monetary Theory in the Trade Cycle, Fritz Mocklip, uh, 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 on uh, uh, credit, uh, the trade cycle, and capital formation, prices and production, a book by Eric Schiff. And interestingly enough, to how, how did these books get financed? How did salaries get paid? Well, we found all the pay records. We found all the pay records. Yes, Whitewater, Austrian Whitewater. In fact, I, matter of fact, I'm a little concerned. There's one here. There's one here that Hayek has paid 400 shillings on September 30th, 1932 with Oscar Morgan Stern's signature, right? The smoking gun. This is after Hayek is already at the London School of Economics. <laughs> we'll hide that one. We'll, we'll, we'll shred it, anyway. <laughs> but uh, these were the, some of the type of documents that we were able to find. Uh, also, interestingly enough, whenever the board of directors meetings occurred, uh, all of the uh, attendees signed them. 
And so here are signatures. We have uh, Mises' signature is distinctive there. Uh, and it's very interesting. We have the signatures of many of the other leading uh, Austrians of the time, a very well known in the German language Austrian mo capital and monetary theorist Richard Striegel is here. Uh, we have one in which uh, Mises' name is right above Hans Meyer, who is the uh, Austrian uh, professor of economics at the university and the black sheep of the Austrian movement, a Nazi collaborator. Um, and in fact, we even found in the files this a postcard written by Hans Meyer to the Institute saying, I can't attend your meeting because I'm off on vacation. And in fact, we have interestingly found uh, such a postcards from, for example, this fellow Karl Prebrum saying, I'm off on holiday and this is where I am in the Alps, leave me alone. But if you need me, here's my address. And uh, from an Austrian newspaper in the mid-30s, we actually found this sheet here, which was an article about Oscar Morgenstern, in which there was a, a drawing of him. Um, and also in the archives was a letter that Mises wrote in his capacity with the Austrian Chamber of Commerce to the Austrian Institute for Business Cycle Research, saying that uh, one of the chamber's members of the institute had passed away, and this is the formal notice of him being replaced by someone else. So this is just sort of, if you're sort of a document freak and, you know, interested curiosities, here's a document by Mises on chamber stationery writing to the institute of which he's the vice president. But this is sort of a curiosity, and actually I'm planning to frame this and hang on the wall at this young. And it's dated October 18th, 1928. Uh, also, we found uh, that in 1936, in July 1936, the uh, Business Cycle Institute had hosted an international conference of the Business Cycle Institutes of Europe, uh, and in people interested in business cycle theory from the United States as well. And uh, we found in the archives that everyone attending this conference had had their picture taken by a professional photographer for the Institute. So we found some early photographs. I took, uh, I had, I borrowed them and made copies. It's a strange thing. I couldn't like tend, tend the, take them to the local Kodak guy. Uh, they, they were copyrighted, so I had to track down the original f photography studio in Vienna, which luckily was only across the street from the Opera House. But they're still in existence. They made me pay an arm and a leg, which meant I couldn't really afford to make copies of all of them. But there was a very famous Polish free market economist, an Austrian, who worked with Mises in Geneva, named Michael Halprin. And we found an early picture of Michael Halprin. He was a monetary theorist. And uh, an early Gottfried Hobbler, who was a student of, um, of Mises's. A picture of this famous Austrian capital monetary theorist. I'd never seen a picture of him, Richard Striegel. Richard Striegel. And it was very interesting. Uh, I had heard a rumor <coughs> that Striegel had uh, been killed by the Nazis during the war. In fact, he had a lung cancer, and uh, he died from lung cancer in 1942. Hayek, in fact, in, in, in London, wrote a obituary about him during the war, saying that one of the great hopes of a revival of true liberalism in Austria was now lost, because being, besides being an Austrian theorist, he was a leading classical liberal, and he was seen as the hope after the war of a revival of these ideas, and he passed away. Uh, we also uh, found an early picture of Hayek, which I don't think has had much circulation in these files as well. And then, being somewhat of an Austrian, I never leave without another now photograph of Mises, my little Porta Mises picture. <laughs> my little Morda, Porta Mises, uh, <laughs> which I also found in the archives. And I, I, I don't think this picture had been seen before either. This was the picture taken of Mises at this international conference, which I also had to pay an arm and a leg for a copy of. Uh, also, and we almost choked, is that, oh yes, and then one other thing is, what I found there was a group photo from this conference. And in this picture, in the middle of it is Mises, and he is being politically incorrect in the group of non-smokers. He's holding a cigarette. My kind of guy. <laughs> yes, I do smoke with great pleasure. But there he is, holding a little cigarette, looking like a happy guy. And none of the non-smokers are, are looking cranky at him. Ah, the old days. Anyway, we have Oscar Morgenstern here. We have uh, Gottfried Hobbler. 
We have uh, Alvin Hansen, who was a fam later became a famous uh, Keynesian economist. Uh, and a number of other prominent economists are all in this little rogues picture. And this picture, to my knowledge, has never been seen before. And this is sort of a, I consider it a very, very uh, nice and uh, fine. Then what we almost choked at, and what they, they were going to throw away, because they said that they had no use for it. You see, the Institute is very peculiar. They have no living memory of the origin of the Institute. They know that Mises was a founder. They know that Hayek was the first director. But they really aren't very much interested in the Austrian School of the History of the Institute. This is the Institute guest book from the 1930s. Now, most of you, perhaps not too familiar with the history of economic thought, will know who some of these names are. But some of you who do know a little bit about economics in this century will recognize the name Dennis Robertson. Trinity College, September 1st, 1930. John R. Hicks, London School of Economics, September 1930. Jacob Viner, University of Chicago. Umberto Ricci from Italy. Some guy who was a member of the Italian Cooperativist Association. Boo. Uh, several times we have the signature of a famous uh, Swedish economist, uh, Bertello Lean. Uh, another Swedish economist, Gustav Okerman. Uh, Per, ja per, per Jacobson, Jan Tinbergen, who was a central planner Nobel laureate. And all of these are the signatures from the early 1930s. Varga. Huh, excuse Varga. me? Varga. And Varga, who was, uh, who was the head of the Hungarian Institute and uh, was a somewhat of a prominent uh, socialist. Uh, so this was, I consider this uh, just an historical curiosity with autographs, a fascinating find. Uh, I'm hoping to make uh, oh yes, and one other here, from one of the board meetings is this picture of the board members of the Austrian Institute. And uh, half seen here is Hayek and a very young, also Oscar Morgenstern in this photo which we got. Uh, we're hoping to make another trip to Vienna. There are a number of archives, as I've suggested, that I have not gone through that I believe will uh, bring forth a number of interesting aspects such as the archives of the Austrian Economic Society, which was the equivalent of, uh, in America to the American Economic Association, in which Mises was the vice president. And we have been told that in somewhere in an archive are the minutes of all of the meetings of this Austrian Economic Society, possibly with copies of all the papers delivered. This would be fascinating for the following reason. In the late 20s and early 30s, it would be Austrian economists at these professional economics meetings analyzing and arguing over the causes, consequences, and cures of the Great Depression. Austrians arguing among themselves in dealing with these problems. This could be an interesting thing in the intellectual history of the school. Uh, also, uh, Mises ta taught for eight years at the Graduate Institute for International Studies in Geneva, Switzerland. He also, through the Institute, was doing a lot of work for the uh, League of Nations. One of the unpublished memorandums that he had done I, in fact, found on my last trip to Geneva several years ago and included in a volume of Mises' essays that I edited, which was published by Kluwer Academic Press uh, uh, under the sponsorship of the Mises Institute. And I'm convinced that uh, with a bit more time at the League of Nations archives, I may find a lot more because what we found at the Institute in Vienna was, in fact, that the Business Cycle Institute was working closely with the League of Nations. They were participating in conferences and memorandum par uh, preparations for them on economic policy concerning the Depression and international trade and tariffs and agricultural policy. Oscar Morgenstern had had a lot of contacts with the Rockefeller Foundation. It'll be very interesting to try to get into the archives of the Rockefeller Foundation because what we found here, and I have photocopies here, beginning in 1935 and 1936, Morgenstern is commissioning people to do working papers in English. Why? Because he's trying to use them as fundraising devices to get money from the Rockefeller Foundation on the problems of economic policy in Central European and Balkan countries in conjunction with the other business cycle institutes that existed in Eastern Europe. And in a sense, it's very frustrating because you realize that if there had not been World War II, if Austria had not been annexed by, by Germany, Morgenstern was a very successful coordinator and organizer and fundraiser. And the institute under him would have been a focal point for organizing all of these other organizations to analyze problems of economic policy and economic reform from a more or less Austrian perspective. And the war 
preempted that completely. Um, so those are the types of things I've been doing. It's only a start. I consider this only touching the surface. To be honest, uh, I was fortunate enough last summer to get a, a, a nice research grant from Hillsdale College, which enabled me to make this trip, uh, not as long as I wanted or needed to, and certainly needed to. But I'm hoping to make uh, at least one more extended trip there to go through the ar other archives in Vienna and in Geneva, uh, and through that to be able to create a picture of both uh, Mises' life, Mises' work, and the atmosphere and issues and problems that the Austrian school faced in general. Thank you very much.